A very good evening, a warm welcome to Dan Really Likes Wine, presented by Pick and Pay. And welcome back to the Dan Really Likes Wine studio. Last Thursday, we were sitting in the heart of the Sabi Sands Reserve, drinking up the wine cellar at Cheetah Plains and sharing some wine thoughts with Chris and Andrea Mullineau, as well as with Gottfried Marker from Book and Hearts Club, some tremendous wine and a tremendous spot. And once again, a big thank you to Archie and the Ranger Buck Safari team. And we don't just finish with our trip last week, because coming up next week, our annual weekly show, annual weekly show, our weekly weekly show, <laughs> will be Maps Maponyane drinking some Keat first verse and talking us through his wine story from the deck at Cheetah Plains. And the week after that, joined by the other of our Ranger Back Ambassadors, in this case uh, is Janil de Villiers, the former Dakar winner, and he'll be telling his wine story, and in particular, his great friendship with Jean Engelbrecht and the time he spent at Rustin Frieda, and the time he spent drinking a little Rustin Frieda, which is actually what we will be drinking from Chitwa Chitwa, which was the second of the two lodges we tried out. Terrific few days and a wonderful trip with Ranger Buck Safaris. But back home, back in the cellar, and talking not just wine today, but also parenthood, because both of our guests have got new kids. So if they look a little tired, a little fatigued, well, you'll know why. They've been changing nappies and doing midnight feeds and all the other delights associated with small children in their earliest stages. The second of those two guests will be joining in about 20 minutes or so. One of the taller people in the wine industry, Peter Allen Finlayson, who juggles both the Kristallen brand as well as Gabriel's Kluf, Gabriel's Kluf. Uh, we'll get the exact pronunciation from Peter Allen just a little later on. A wine from each of those labels and what great labels they are. Gabriel's Kluf, Gabriel's Kluf in particular, I think it's come on in leaps and bounds over the last few years. And it's always been a delight when in the Potrofia area to stick my head in for a tasting and usually walk away with a few cases. But before we do that, a man who you will know from two spaces. One of them is as one of the stars of the television series Vikings, where he plays a particularly fierce and cutthroat member of the savage Nordic cast. But when he's not terrifying people on small canoes in the fjords of Norway or invading Britain, he's busy making wine and making some terrific wine at that. His name is Donovan Rahl, and he's with us today. Donovan, good evening. Hey, Dan. How's it going? Oh, good, good. I, I almost have to take back what I said there because I forgot quite how intimidating you are. So if uh, <laughs> referencing the Vikings uh, was somewhat upsetting, I take it all back. Uh, but uh, but really good evening. Lovely to have you on the show. And thank you for joining us. And, and congratulations. Uh, just how long has little Raul number two been with us? Uh, just over seven weeks now. So, yes, we're not sleeping that much, but it's, it's an amazing experience. Um, two is a little bit harder than one, but... You know, we've been through a few of us, so we, we have a few late nights normally once a year, so not too bad. Uh, you also tend to, certainly from my experience with two little ones, uh, by the time the second one comes around, you've almost forgotten uh, just how tough those first three months are, the lack of sleep and the fact that life is a general blur. Yeah, everyone tells you it's, it's much easier the second time around. Um, everyone's lying. It's definitely not. It's <laughs> <laughs> Fourth time around, that's the way to go, Donald. Uh, I'm interested whether it, uh, there's been time to do it with uh, uh, with the second little girl or whether you've already uh, uh, done it with, uh, with the first. Was there a particular wine celebration? Had you kept a bottle for the arrival of the first or the second kid? Anything to mark the occasion in particular? Um, not yet. Well, I mean, I, uh, I started the range, um, well, there's a bottle actually, um, for the first one when she, the year she was born, I started the, um, the Ava range and the second one is called Noah. Um, so hopefully in the future I'll find one or two new vineyards that can bear her name as well. Uh, it's a lovely touch. Great to be able to do when you are a winemaker and, uh, and do exactly that, which you have. Uh, the uh, the name won't, uh, I think, have a huge impact on the popularity of your wine because it sells out so quickly anyway. In fact, such is your popularity that already Mr. Greg Sherwood, who's watching with us, has uh, said this is my favorite Viking. Uh, the wines uh, the wines that you've had, the, the, the new releases have just kicked in, and we're going to be trying a couple of those in just a moment. Uh, but first of all, the, the wine story. How did Donovan Ralph fall into the world of wine, and what's taken you to where you find yourself now? You know, I, 
I started studying um, BSc with psychology, actually, um, at Stellenbosch University. And then being in the Winelands, you know, drinking more wine than learning about wine. But um, the bug just bit me. And after two years, I decided to change my course to BSc uh, in Viticulture and Enology. And that I finished in 2005. Um, I did a short harvest with, with Eben in the Swartland um, before I headed off to Cloudy Bay in New Zealand and the Rhone, um, the, the Mosul as well, Burgundy, just traveled a bit, made some wine and came back in 2008 and decided, listen, I can make wine for other people uh, for the first part of my career or I can just give it a go and start with my own wine straight away. That's what I did. So in 2008, uh, the Royal White was the first wine I made under my own label. Um, that was a whopping six barrels. It's grown a bit since then. Um, and the one we'll be tasting now is already my 12th vintage of that particular wine. It's wine that's had a huge success. You talk about the travel. It's a recurring theme when I speak to a lot of our winemakers. They've spent that time around the world. How important was it for you to, to get some to discover winemaking beyond just the borders of South Africa? Well, for me at that stage, you know, you need to... You need to experience, and more than experiencing the cellars, I think you need to taste the wines from around the world if you want to see what you're up against. Um, at that stage, the wine coming into South Africa from the other regions, uh, there weren't that much um, going around. And obviously, if you're starting out just out of university, you're not going to be able to buy loads and loads of foreign wines to, to train your palate. So after a harvest I did at Takara with Miles Mossop, I actually went to London um, and I worked in a wine shop called Harvey Nichols just to experience wine, just to have access to all of those wines. And from there, I just continued my travels. Um, and again, tasting wine to me was much more important almost than going into the cellars just to just to experience the rest of the world and to see the flavors and, and the soils and things that, that they have that we don't. So that was very important for my journey. And it clearly worked because as Greg Sherwood has just pointed out, uh, Donovan Raul White, first three vintages, three by five star platters must be a first for any winemaker. Do you know of any other winemaker whose very first three vintages have all got the uh, the hallowed five stars from the Plata crew? Well, um, I'm not sure. I mean, I think Cape Point's um, Isla Duncan might have done that a, a couple of times. Um, yeah, funny story about that. My first vintage, the 08, um, I entered into Plata um, after phoning all of my friends said, listen, must I enter my wine into anything? And I said, well, to start out, you definitely need to enter it into platter. Um, and when I got the call from Inna, um, who's now at the Chenin Blanc Association, telling me that I got five stars, I, I literally couldn't believe it. So I phoned her back twice because I actually thought it was one of my friends just making a joke. Um, but yeah, I've been very lucky with um with platters and yeah i've gotten some nice ratings which i'm which i'm very proud of and rightly so rightly so well deserved they are as well let's have a look at that uh roll wine we don't have the 2008 but we do have the 2019 which we're going to be drinking uh, these came out i got to taste these uh, with derek kilpin uh, owner of the greatest collection of slightly effeminate scarves in all of johannesburg <laughs> and uh, we went through all of them, uh, this amongst them, uh, and it was an absolute treat then. And it would be a treat now if you wanted to get some, except uh, you almost can't because uh, your wine has just about sold out and only released a few weeks ago. Would that be right? Um, yeah, well, the, the local allocations have, have been sent out. Um, I think they are mostly sold out. You know, even through lockdown and, and the issues the, win the wine industry has had, uh, the support from the local, um, the public, my 
the people that buy my, my wines usually, that's been incredible. Um, even more so than, than previous years. So, yeah, we have to thank all the consumers for still still believing us and buying our wines. Well, there's a, there's a reason for it. I know one of the people who's bought them is Daryl Balfour. He's busy watching on YouTube. Evening gents just opened their Royal White 2015 to accompany the show. Good call, Daryl. It'll go down very nice. A little bit of bottle aging there. Uh, this is the 2019. I see we also have uh, Lenore Yapi asking, did we have a winner for the competition? I presume, uh, Lenore, that would be the uh, Banhook Cabernet Sauvignon competition. Yep, we announced it live on the show last Thursday. Uh, I can't off the top of my head remember who it is, but I'll make sure I'll post it again just so you know straight after the show. But yes, we did have two winners there. Uh, so the Royal White 2019, it is a blend. Uh, Shannon Blanc, we know. Viognier, we know. Uh, Verdelio sounds like he could be the new Brazilian centre forward signed by Barcelona. Uh, but in this case, <laughs> Verdelio is actually a great. We get a lot of people on the show who are uh, still learning a little about wine, myself very much amongst them. Uh, give us a little bit of information on the Verdelio as a grape uh, and why it found its way into this particular blend. You know, um, the first time I ever tasted Verdelio in South Africa was uh, the vintage with Eben in my first vintage in the Swartland. And what impressed me about the variety was even in that climate, um, it had incredible acidity. So if you're working with grapes from mostly the Swatland, um, you know, super hot, dry land formed, you need something to freshen the wine. So two options, you, you pick early, which I do most of my wines, but something like Modelo gives you incredible texture. And at the same time, it will have the highest acidity of anything in your cellar. Um, so in the last three, four years that we've experienced the drought, the percentage of Adelo has actually increased to almost 30%, where I started out with only one barrel initially. Um, so it's it's becoming a big part of this wine, and it definitely adds to the freshness, but also the texture of the wine. Which we're about to sample. Final question before I do try it, and I'm holding off sure. here with great... Uh, Great resolve. Uh, I see on the label, wine of origin coastal region, whereas the red we're tasting at the moment is wine of origin Swartland. But what are yes. the origins of these particular grapes? So some of the Vidello, um, all, all the Shannon is from a granite vineyard, mostly in the Swartland, in the Paderberg. Um, that's 68% of the blend. Then Vidello is a combination from one vineyard in Swartland. It's grown on schist and another component in Stellenbosch um, in the Halderberg, which is grown on very deep red clay, which I've learned in the last couple of years suits the variety very well. Um, and then the Viognier is obviously Swatland, but that's a very small portion. It's about 4%. All right, little splash of elegance to complete the blend. All right, well, let's give it a go. And what I can tell you, um, I've spoken to a few scientist mates of mine is that apparently if you regularly drink a white blend that combines Viognier, Chenin Blanc and Verdelio, just the luster and the glisten it gives your hair and your beard is extraordinary. <laughs> so more than just one good reason to drink it. <laughs> Ooh. That's the reason I drink it, for sure. Mm. Clearly. Oh, that's a real treat, Donovan. Mm. Um, ah. Shall you a little bit more about how it's made? Um, you know, the vineyards, I've worked with all of them for, or most of them, for the last 12 years now. Um, so I don't need to do too much in the cellar. You know, the, these vineyards have, we've, we've, we've now got them to a point where we harvest, we press the grapes, we put it to barrel. Um, the fermentations are naturally, um, because we now figure out, or we, we know now when to, when to pick them. Um, the acid is usually not a problem, so we pick them in various stages to get the right level of acidity as well. Um, so the winemaking is very basic. Um, this, vin this particular wine is all done in older barrels and bottled after about 11 months in barrel. 
not an unusual question to be asking any South African winemaker at the moment when it comes to white blends, uh, but I put it to you nonetheless to see what your particular answer is. The aging of this wine, it, it tastes lovely at the moment, but it also screams out to me, Dan, buy some more, but keep it if you can find some more. Uh, definitely got longer to go. Where, where do you see this one reaching its high point? Um, personally, to me, um, I love it about four or five years from now. Um, the wine will, will gain texture, get, gain some complexity. Um, this particular wine in the older vintages, I noticed this almost like a fennel anise character, which I love. Um, and then obviously, I don't, won't say push it too far, but I mean, perfect drinking window for me is five to eight years from now. Oh, provided I can get some more, I shall diarize it. I'll also, I love the, I love the aniseed fennel reference. This would feed quite nicely. I have my Greek parents-in-law staying with me at the moment, so uh, the rest of this bottle, followed by some ouzo, uh, might make for a particularly good evening and a particularly bad morning tomorrow. But a, <laughs> a sacrifice worth making. All right, that is our first wine down. Off to a really good start. So the Raul Red has got its work cut out for it by comparison. Uh, so let's move over to blend number two. Uh, and this, we have some Syrah, some Grenache, some Carignan, some Cinso. So immediately we get a, a broader feel for what the style is. Uh, but I'll, uh, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, this one is all Swatland based uh, based on the back. Uh, the style of red here, Donovan, was this more... These are the grapes I have access to, the grapes I can work with, or is this the kind of style uh, that says uh, this This is a real Donovan Rolls signature red? No, to me, um, you know, when I started out in 2008 with the two wines only, um, these two wines were always going to be the foundation of my, my business. Um, and still today, they are the biggest production. And I would say they are the hardest... I've, the, the two wines I've worked the hardest on to to get the balance. You know that's why we blend to get the balance. And in this particular wine, um, it's obviously Rhone driven. That's that's the reds that I love. Um, it used to be only Syrah with Grenache, but with the drought, um, you know, we needed something fresher um, to add to the wine. And with with the Syrah, you can only pick it that early. Uh, Grenache, the same story. And Carignan has very, very high Cinso. Uh, um, there's very, very high acidity levels, much higher than Cinso. But Cinso, again, you can pick very, very early. So I added these varieties from 2017 onwards um, just to get more freshness in the wine. And I think, I mean, to date, I think this is the most Rhone-like um, roll red I've I've made. It's um, I would say it's almost inspired um, more about the Southern Rhone, a little bit more sort of Chateauneuf du Pape compared to the previous years um, when it was slightly more Syrah driven. Uh, it used to be 85% um, and more Syrah. This vintage is 70% Syrah, 12% Grenache. 10 Senso and 8% Carignan. It's interesting you mentioned Chateauneuf du Pub because I've heard a number of producers out of France in the last little while suggesting that they are hoping that their Chateauneuf du Pub is tasting a little more roll like. Uh, so uh, it's definitely working both ways. Uh, I see Greg Sherwood confirming that Hanford is selling the 2018 Royal White in London, about to receive the 2019 allocations. Uh, 15 to 20% of each allocation going straight down Sherwood's throat, uh, together with the uh, oysters. Uh, Derek Kilpin joining us, the uh, uh, junior assistant sommelier at Great Domains, uh, who yes. did a great job of... Uh, uh, whitewashing tax through a wine business. Uh, Derek saying that he hopes uh, hopes Greg wasn't too greedy with his allocation of wine. Uh, I also see a message from my dear mother. Uh, the wine also saying keep some from your mother. I'm not sure that this will go really well with a plastic straw, but I shall keep some nonetheless. Uh, you've mentioned with both of the wines bringing in wine that has got more acidity having an impact on the wine, the freshness picking a little bit earlier. Uh, I'm getting a, a sense, particularly on the Swartland, 
there's a real understanding of the issues of climate change, of how that's shifting already our wine space, but is likely to do so even more. How much are you looking ahead to that, thinking, right, I'm, uh, there's going to be some rala shiftiko on the horizon, there are going to be different types of grapes, and we're going to have a, a shifting scale of what we're making? I think it's it's definitely going to um, go that way because, you know, we figured out more or less which varieties work in which regions. Um, and even deeper than that, uh, which varieties work on which soils. But for the future, we have to bring in some new varieties. Um, there's a lot of experimentation happening. Um, I mean, I went to Priorat last year just, just to taste wine again and see if there's something that might work back home. Um, and I even I even uh, tasted some Carignan Blanc, which might might be something that's perfectly suited to the Swartan. I mean, things like Grenache, I think will start playing a, a massive role in the future because Grenache actually loves the climate. I mean, if, if you drive in the middle of harvest, you, you drive to a vineyard and it looks very happy and it's lush green, it, it's probably going to be Grenache. You know, it, it almost wants it. Um, but for blending, um, something like Bordello with higher acidities, um, it ripens very, very early. Um, before we get the heat waves. Um, and for the reds, yeah, I mean, you never know. Something something interesting most of the people at home have never heard of. Um, but there's definitely some some interesting being, things being planted. And I think in the next 10 to 20 years, you'll see a lot of new varieties um, coming into our blends especially. And I do, uh, I do love that about our South African winemakers and the, and the Swartlanders in particular. And I've had uh, many in conversation over the last few months. That sense of adventure, that willingness to push boundaries and do a bit of experimentation. And uh, we just benefit as those of us who drink your wine. So thank you for it. Uh, before I let you go, because I know you've got your uh, your 6 p.m. conditioning to do. Can't have any <laughs> split ends while you're making wine. The uh, Of all the wine that you've made, uh, is there one particular bottle of something uh, that just always has a, a special place in that barrel-shaped heart of Donovan Rall? Oh, that's a, that's a very difficult question. Um, I think if I, I think the most out of the 12 vintages um, of Rall White specifically, I mean, because that was my very first wine um, and that sort of got me going, the 09 was to me very special. Um, the 15 I loved very much, and then the 11 I think has potential to, we'll see, but potential to be just as good. Um, but I must say, my favorite one I, I ever made was the first vintage of this, um, and I've tried to keep a, a bit back. Um, to enjoy over the next 18 years and someday hopefully with with Ava. But yeah, I have to say that would be my my favorite wine thus far, the 2017 uh, Royal Ava Syrah. Well, you can't ask for a better endorsement than that. I suspect there's a little emotion in that decision, and rightly so. A proud dad celebrating his daughter. Uh, Donovan, thank you so much. It's been lovely spending a little time with you, drinking your wine, uh, which is terrific. Uh, and the only time I drank it properly before was in a tasting with Derek Kilpin, uh, which really gives you no information whatsoever. Spent most of the time talking about the uh, the new release of uh, of satin scarves at uh, some story <laughs> from um, so uh, thank you very much keep making terrific terrific wine and uh, really appreciate you joining us thanks for having me and uh, thanks for everyone who watched see you soon there we go donovan Raul, the star of vikings who also makes some pretty decent wine when he's not on set we've drunk two examples of that and i almost feel a little guilty tasting this wine with you all and telling you how good it is because it's just that hard to get hold of it really is if you find some roll or leap at it take it and share it with nobody make sure it is all yours daryl balfour checking in watching us on youtube at the moment the 15 is fabulous really drinking well if you missed Daryl a little earlier, that's the 2015 White Blend, which has clearly found favour 
the man who's got a very, very accomplished palate. Okay, let us say goodbye to the blonde bombshell and instead head over to the brooding uh, brunette who is waiting for us in the Bottle of Fear area. He's part of probably the greatest family dynasty in South African winemaking. There are Finlaysons absolutely everywhere. You can't move in the Hemalala Valley or a uh, greater region without bumping into one of them, which is a great bonus for the South African wine industry because collectively they have added such a rich layer to everything that's been done over oh, probably the last 40 years or so when you go back to, to Peter and Walter and now the current generation of rock stars. I was going to say up and coming, but I think they've more than gone past that. So let's say a very good evening to Peter Allen Finlayson. How are you, Dan? Ah, there we go. Welcome here. Good evening. And uh, I'll start in uh, in the same way I did with Donovan. Uh, I think his eyes were looking a little wearier than yours. You've, uh, I think, got past the initial worst of it. Uh, but there is a, a very young, very young Finlayson in the household at the moment. There is, yeah. We've had our second child, another boy, um, second boy, and his name is Rupert, and he's four months old and still not sleeping very well. <laughs> uh, Jerry, by the time they're six, they're sleeping through the night, so you should be absolutely fine. No, thanks so much. That really makes me uh, uh, really take a lot of comfort from that. <laughs> uh, let's, uh, let's look at this remarkable family tree of yours. It's uh, an all mighty tanglement of great winemaking brilliance. Uh, we had Peter Finlayson on the show just a couple of weeks ago, the godfather of Pinot Noir in South Africa. And if I've got this right, Peter is your dad, Walter is your uncle, David and Caroline are your cousins, and is it Andrew is your brother? That's correct, yeah. <laughs> I've mastered my genealogy. Hey, what, what's it like growing up in that sort of family? I guess you, you can't do anything but make wine if you're a Finlayson in South Africa. Yeah, I mean, it's it's always different, I think, being in it than what it looks like from the outside. Um, I mean, I, I went to university, University of Stellenbosch to study wine, but I actually failed my winemaking degree. Um, so I, I dropped out about just over two years in, and then I studied uh, philosophy and economics. But obviously, once I finished my philosophy and economics degree, I, you know, didn't really, uh, my prospects for finding employment with that degree weren't great. Um, and I got back into wine after that. So, yeah, I, I tried to get out of it, but it just sucked me back in, you know. Very happily so. Probably a good call. I have an honours degree in English, which I think placed me on a, a similar footing for striding yeah. out into the working world. Uh, I've found part of what I do for a living in the drinking of wine. You have it in the in the making of wine. And you've got an interesting split because you've got the two labels. There's the Crystallum, which is you and your brother. And then yep. there's the, uh, the, is it Gabriel's Kloof or Gabriel's Kloof? So it's, it's Gabriel's Kloof. Uh, it was started by my father-in-law, Bernard Haynes. Uh, they are very much an Afrikaans family and named after a gentleman by the name of Gabriel Leroux, uh, who owned the farm in the 1800s. So, but obviously you, you're very welcome to say Gabriel's Kloof if you're speaking to people that don't understand the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I find it easier after a few glasses of wine. I definitely get that. Uh, how, how does that split work? You're, you're making the wine at Gabriel's Clough. You're also making the Cristal Amar. How does that balance come about? Um, I'm not quite sure. It just it kind of does. You know, so uh, I have very good help in the cellar, very good. I have an assistant for Cristal and an assistant for Gabriel's Clough. So I've just become very good at, at giving orders. Um, but it's, uh, it's been a challenge. It was a difficult decision to make, uh, you know, moving across to Carbos Cliff. When I was just doing Cristalum, I had a lot more free time in my hands. But uh, um, your decision that, um, you know, and my father-in-law might be watching, so I better say the right things, that I'm incredibly happy I did and incredibly proud to be part of Carbos Cliff <laughs> as well. But no, it has, it's all, it all works out really, really well. And, uh, yeah, I've just managed to uh, manage my time better. And, you know, it's it's – Difficult, uh, there's a lot of potential pitfalls sort of working with one's own family and one's brother and one's in-laws. Uh, but yeah, so far, so good. What could possibly go wrong as anybody who's ever watched 
Well, no. Let's, uh, let, let's start with the Cristal and before we move on to Gabriel's Club uh, and this label you have. Uh, how did that come about? Was that just you and your brother deciding to, to start up a wine label and see where it went? Yeah, so my, um, in, while I was studying my second, uh, second degree, uh, my father had obviously gotten a bit tired of uh, shelling out lots of cash for his son who wasn't doing much. And I took over the agency um, selling imported French oak wine barrels during um, what I was still studying. Um, and then, you know, doing that, going around, speaking to winemakers, um, yeah, I, I kind of then started toying with the idea of, of getting back into wine, starting to make a bit of wine. And while I was at university, spoke to my father about, um, you know, backing myself and my brother uh, to start making a bit of wine. So it started, my cousin Carolyn was very kind to offer me cellar space in 2007. Um, so that was the first vintage I made at Creation Wines. Um, I made Sauvignon Blanc, uh, Chardonnay and Pinot in that year. But the Sauvignon Blanc was the only wine that actually made it into a bottle. The Chardonnay and the Pinot uh, reflected the fact that I had failed winemaking. So they went into the drain. You've, uh, after one or two little hiccups, you found yourself in a, yeah. in a terrific space with them. We're about to try uh, one of them, of the, the several pinots that you made. Uh, talk to me about that range, because you've got you've got a fair few. You've also got a fair few Chardonnays. And how, how do those different ranges work out? What, what, what makes one of them different to another? So we will start with the one that we're going to be tasting uh, now, um, the Peter Max Pinot. So the Peter Max Pinot and the Agnes Chardonnay are my, what I call my multiple uh, vineyard blends. So those are uh, both of them, I think, in the in the 18 and the 19 were made sourced from five different vineyards, uh, the fruit for those wines. So those wines we make in, in slightly you know larger volumes. They're um, ready for drinking a little earlier and obviously a bit more reasonably priced. And then I've got the single vineyard wine. So those are my top wines. And those are uh, the wines made from the top vineyards that I work with. So Pinot, I've got three of them, and Chardonnay, one of them. Uh, and in terms of working out what goes into what, is it a fairly simple process? And bang, those are terrific grapes. Those are going straight into the cinema cuvee, for example, uh, or is it a, a little bit more work than that? Yeah, you know, look, it's it's fairly simple in the fact that the you know the, the single vineyards come from specific vineyards, um, and I know those. You know, I've been working with all of the vineyards that I work with now. I've been working with since 2013 was the last year that I took on a new vineyard that's become a single vineyard. Um, you know, so I've gotten to know those vineyards very, very well. Um, but there's always, you know, I try not to be too prescriptive about things. Um, there's, you know, in a year like 2019, there's no bona fides, so no Himalayan Valley uh, cuvee because that just wasn't quite good enough. So the single vineyards really, really have to be up there. You know, we, we're charging uh, decent prices for those wines um, and the quality has got to warrant the price as well. I don't think we can argue too much with the quality. I remember sitting at Jace Navitan's restaurant, the Pollen Street Kitchen in London, and uh, ordering a, a bottle of your Pinot Noir off the wine list, but not telling my guest what it was. And he uh, tasted it, nodded, and said, that's a great French Burgundy. And uh, to explain to him that it was actually an even better wine because it came from South Africa. A uh, question coming in from one of our guests, Daryl Balfour, who's been with us through the show, wanting to know what happened to Peter Allen's Cobb cellar? So the Cobb cellar was the first building that we used uh, to sell our wines. And we made that out of clay, basically clay and, and uh, hay bales. Um, and that farm was called Crystal Kloof, hence the name Crystallum, the Latin for crystal. Um, but when I joined my wife's family, um, and if you've seen the cellar at Harbors Kloof, you'll know why I made the move. Uh, it really, really is a fantastic cellar. Um, we made the call to sell that property and that cellar. So Daryl, it, it belongs to somebody else now, unfortunately. Oh, violins playing quietly in the background. But I think you've you've more than made up for it with Harbriel's Clerf, which we'll get onto in just a moment. I've spent many happy hours there. Uh, so the uh, uh, the Peter Max, if somebody's watching, they don't have the Peter Max in hand, uh, and they'd yep. like to know what they would be looking out for. Uh, talk us through this particular wine and, and what makes it stand out for you. Yeah, so I think it's, you know, because it's a it's sort of a blend of multiple vineyards, uh, each of those vineyards brings something interesting to the wine. So you've got that classic bit of um, Pinot Funk, uh, you know, what some people call forest floor, uh, you know, that sort of character that's not always that easy to explain, but it's what makes Pinot so interesting. Then you've got your sour cherry. Um, you've got a bit of spice on there, a bit of rose petal. 
um, you know, and uh, palette-wise, um, really elegant, uh, a bit of grip on the mid palette, but like, you know, very much in the style of the wines that I like to make. So it's got flavor. Um, there's a lot going on there, but it's, it's not heavy. You know, I, uh, I like to drink wines that are elegant. Um, you know, something that my father always spoke about growing up is, is not making and not drinking black wines, you know, so really wines that have character, but on heavy. Well, I think this is a, a, one of many wines you made that your father would be very proud of. It's not hard to see where the winemaking genes have come from. I think also important to point out, you'll see Peter Allen using a spittoon there. Everything in that spittoon gets shipped up to Johannesburg, where Derek Kilpin uses it to make his house blend if you ever drop by to Chateau Kilpin. Just ask for a glass of water and leave uh, very, very hurriedly. I also see a message in there from Greg Sherwood. The Cuvée Cinema and whole bunch styles seem to be slowly converging in style. Two incredible wines without doubt, both with a huge following in London. Is, uh, is that an accurate assessment in your book, Peter Allen? I think so. So the Cuvée Cinema, the 2019 uh, is 70% whole cluster. Um, and now this is going to confuse people because I make a whole bunch wine for Cristalin, but I also make a whole bunch for Harbour's Cliff, which we're going to be tasting next. So the whole bunch for Cristalin is, is more of a sort of an experimental wine where I do 100% whole cluster. Um, and most of that fruit also comes from the Cuvée Cinema Vineyard. But Greg will see with the 2020, I've gone back to using only about 30% whole cluster. So that all just depends on the, on the vintage. So I think they have converged, uh, you know, going through 16, 17, 18, uh, and 19, but they'll kind of diverge from each other. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had a bit of a well, it's, they'll it's, go it's the excitement. for the 2020. Yeah. It's, it's the excitement of winemaking. Things are ebb and flow, and they, uh, they come and go, uh, which, which is uh, a big part of the, the joy of wine. A big part of the joy for me of this show is introducing people to new wine and new terms, etc. You talk about about whole bunch. There'll be people are going, but should I use the whole bunch of grapes anyway? Uh, what yeah. does that mean in terms of winemaking? So in making red wine, you've got a choice. So you, you want to ferment on the skins. So your, your color comes from the skins. And your choice is basically to do you remove the berries from the stems or do you include the whole bunch during the fermentation? So the fermentation, uh, your first part of the winemaking process, and, and that's basically your big decision. There's obviously a lot of other things that come into play then, but that's your, your probably your, your biggest decision, um, you know, right at the start of the winemaking process. So when you're including stems, which is, is not being the fashion, it's coming back now, but in the last 20 years, people have moved away from using stems and have, you focused on whole berries, so removing all the berries from the stems. When you're including stems, you're adding a bit more structure, a bit more grip, and the wines are a bit more old school in the sense of they're a little bit more rustic, a little more tension in them. Um, so that's what I'm looking to do, you know, is to try and introduce um, a slightly more savory kind of rustic character to the wines, but only when it works uh, with a particular vineyard in a particular year, if that makes sense. It does indeed, and that is exactly the approach you've taken with wine number two. So as I set aside what little is left of my Peter Max Pinot Noir uh, and move yep. on to wine number two. Now, I, I've spent a fair amount of time at Harbrils Kloof, which I'm going to keep practicing yep. for the next time I visit, uh, mostly through the Absa Cape Epic. I've emceed a stage there on many occasions and usually slip in afterwards uh, for the wine, for the olive oil, for the hospitality. And if I'm brutally honest, the early stages of the epic, the early years, and we're going back probably 10, 12 years now, and uh, not all of the wines absolutely blew me away. But uh, sort of last five, six years, I've been tasting them again more regularly. I've really enjoyed what I've had to drink. There's been a great selection. They'll be uh, playing around with uh, uh, very clearly showing on the labels uh, certain soil types of the wine has come from. And I've just really enjoyed my, my winemaking experience. Uh, the attraction to move over to Harbrils Club uh, was obviously partly due to the family and your wife telling you, you will do this, darling. And so you did. Exactly. Uh, but there also had to be the, uh, the wine appeal. Uh, give us a, a little sketch of Harbrils Club as, as the property and uh, what you feel your impact has been since you've been there. Yeah, I think it's it's taken everyone there a, a while to really figure out, you know, viticulturally how to work um, and also in the cellar, you know. So 
Um, it, it was a property. That, there was nothing there. My father-in-law had a dream to start up a wine estate. Uh, there, his family's from Middleburg, uh, Pumalanda, Middleburg. Um, and his father-in-law introduced him to wine. So he he wanted to basically, uh, you know, start up an estate, plant vineyards from scratch. And he wanted to work with a board over ITs and with Syrah, but he wanted to find a place that was a little cooler than your traditional areas in South Africa where those grapes are planted, um, but warm enough to make those varieties. So Botriva is, uh, it's in the Walker Bay ward, but it's probably the warmest area of the Walker Bay region uh, probably the warmest ward in the Walker Bay. So it's not suited for Pinot and Chardonnay, but it's really, really well suited to the uh, the Bordeaux varieties uh, and to Syrah. Um, you know, so in that sense, climatically, it's really, really interesting. You've also got great soils. You've got your your shales, your, your Borgerfeld shales, a lot of iron-rich soils. And then going up the slopes, you've got granite and you've got sandstones. There's a lot of variety, and that brings a lot of interest. So for me, it's just been about working out, you know, which are the best uh, varieties, uh, which are the best vineyards? You know, for instance, when I got there, the Cabernet Franc went into a Bordeaux blend. But um, about six months after I'd made my first vintage there in 2015, I was tasting through all the batches, and it was just uh, clear as day to me that the Cabernet Franc was um, head and shoulders above the other Bordeaux varieties um, on that particular property. So now we bottled that on its own. So it's it's been a learning process and it's all the, the ingredients have been there, but um, it's just taken time, I think, to kind of harness all of that um, and get that into bottle. One of those bottles is this one. Uh, first thing I noticed when it got dropped off uh, by Vickers, the head of security who doubles as sommelier at Marble, uh, was, yep. uh, was the label. It's very different to anything I've seen before from Carvedil's Gluff. Yeah, so so we've actually been bringing out a few interesting different things uh, under what we're calling our projects range. So we've got an amphora wine, um, which we make in uh, with Sumina Blanc, that's fermented and aged in clay amphora. And then the whole bunch actually started out um, as a project where I wanted to introduce a more kind of a lighter, uh, fresher portion of Syrah in our estate Syrah. And then once again, also tasting that after about six months, it was it was such a delicious wine that we decided to bottle it on its own. Um, and, you know, it didn't really fit in with the other range. So we decided to design a label from scratch. And uh, my good friend, Sean Harrison from Graft, um, I gave him a brief without too much detail. Um, and he came up with this with label, which I absolutely love. Yeah, I think worth having another look at that. The whole bunch, you can see the bunch of grapes there very clearly. It's uh, incredibly clever and, uh, and very effective. I see Melissa Sutherland uh, saying, I like it. That's a great endorsement. Melissa's a, a regular you, on the show. Uh, so uh, you've, you've made it. You've used the technique you spoke to us uh, about a little earlier. So some whole yeah. bunch syrah from 2019. Uh, yeah. Talk to me a little bit more about this particular wine and, uh, uh, and what it's saying. Yeah, so you've got your classic kind of syrup, you know, pepper, violets, uh, a little bit of sort of an olive brine character. Um, and it's really on the palate that you, that you get that lovely, lovely freshness, you know. So this is made in, in that, you know, Beaujolais style, um, whole clusters thrown into a tank, pressed after about 10 days, and then aged in stainless steel. So this wine doesn't see any barrel whatsoever. Um, and it's really a wine designed, well, not originally designed, but now designed to be drunk early um you know i think a lot of people these days are looking for red wines that are drinkable uh that are approachable when they're younger um you know there's, there's a place for all styles uh and yeah you know, these are the the kind of reds that we like to drink on a you know regular basis so yeah we hope that people agree with that yeah, I remember my first trip to Mendoza and being introduced by winemakers, the bodegas there, to the idea of the fruit bomb Malbec that was uh, to be uh, finished off uh, within a year or two of being made and uh, beautifully light and fruity and then just a lot of fun to drink. And uh, this fits yeah. into exactly that place. For sure. Mm. Uh, question coming in from uh, Derek Kilpin. Is there some healthy competition slash knowledge sharing with next door neighbor brother, I think I have that right, any boss. Does that make any sense to you at all? That does make sense. So the farm Anais Boss um, is next door to Harborough's Cliff, and that is owned by my father-in-law's brother, Johan Haynes. Um, 
he's planted some fantastic dry land vineyards there. And Marilise Niemann of Memento fame, uh, she makes uh, his wine for him. So, yeah, it's it's a much smaller setup. Um, but Marilis, uh, who's made her, made her wines for about five years at Harbour's Cliff, now makes his wine. And they're really, really fantastic, you know. So they're using uh, different varieties to what we use. Uh, they make a white blend with Shannon, uh, Roussan, and there's a little bit of Viognier in there and a little Vidella. Um, so, yeah, I suppose a bit of healthy competition. And it's just a, it's a really delicious wine that we love to drink. Something I've seen a lot of over the last few months in particular when the industries had to circle the wagons and uh, and gather in and provide strength to each other is just how much support there's been, be it your next door neighbor or relative or just the, the, the winemaking community at large. And it's been fantastic to see. As I, I go back to the family story we spoke about right at the start, you're obviously making wine with your brother, but how much wine discussion, conversation, bouncing off of ideas is there between you and your dad, you and your uncle, you and your cousins? Yeah, I mean, I'd say when we're together, the, the topic of discussion is is probably about 95% wine and wine business related, and then 5% surfing. Uh, my brother is probably the other way around, 95% surfing and, and 5% wine. Um, but it's no, it's it's a it's a big part of what we of what we talk about. Obviously, it's an industry that we're all involved in and that we all love very much. We're passionate about, so it, it ends up being at the top of the list. You talk about the family talking about surfing. I'm trying to picture Walter Finlayson on a surfboard uh, in his baggies, just cruising in on a right to left break. I'd uh, pay a good bit of money for that. I'm, I'm sure he would, have, uh, he would have done well. David, his son's a surfer, so. Whose wine uh, we'll be drinking soon. I think uh, he got in touch with me last week. We've got some of his wine on the way. Exciting developments and some new labels with David Finlayson, part of the uh, the greater greater family and empire. Uh, before we let you go and uh, go and change some more nappies and try and sneak in half an hour of sleep if you can, uh, between Cristalum and, uh, and Harbriel's Clove, well, what's on the horizon? Where do you see the two brands going? What, uh, what would you like to see happening over the next five years? Yeah, we, we've with Carbos, we're sorry with Kristan and first uh, we've bought our own plot of land uh, in partnership with a friend of mine, uh, Eben van Beek. Um, so we've planted about four hectares of high density Chardonnay and Pinot there. Um, so that'll come on board in the next couple of years. With Carbos Clough, uh we got Rosa Kruger involved in the viticulture there um, about a year and a half ago. So she's making a hell of a difference there. We're moving towards more of an organic approach towards farming more sustainably. So. I think that's the focus is just try and, you know, try and farm close to nature. Uh, the winemaking, uh, all the wines with Harvest Cliff and Cristalum are naturally fermented. So we, we really take a hands-off approach in the winemaking. And I think it's it's really about focusing on the vineyards and try and maximize, um, you know, what we get out of those vineyards and what we put back into the soil um, as much as, as we can. And I believe that'll lead us to making even better wines. Hard to conceive of if you've tasted them, but uh, we look forward to that happening. I see Greg Sherwood saying the Anais Boss White Blend is truly incredible. Derek Kilpin yeah, yeah. agreeing with him. There's a it's, a it's an amazing bromance between these two. Every time we have a show, they flirt outrageously with each other in the comment section. Uh, and then Daryl Balfour asking, any chance of another Paradisum one day? Love that wine. So the Paradisum was a red blend that I made under the Cristalum label. Uh, and decided to drop it. 2014 was the last vintage. Um, I lost access to the Syrah vineyard that I was using to make that wine. And I also just felt that it was kind of getting in the way of the focus of Cristalum. So I've got a lot of things on my plate and I tend not to focus. So it was a decision made um, with a view to towards the bland, brand being a bit more focused. So uh, possibly Daryl, but uh, not anytime soon. Uh. As Daryl sheds a single tear and fondly remembers that paradisum. Uh, if you have the chance to get out to Harbriel's Cliff, don't take my word for it. Take Melissa Sutherland's. The views from Harbriel's Cliff, especially in this canola season, are incredible. That they certainly are. Throw in the wine, the hospitality, the olive oil, this lovely little restaurant as well. And you can buy Cristal and wine when you're at Harbriel's Cliff at very favorable prices. Uh, so it makes it all uh, an extremely good set of reasons to head out and visit. Uh, Peter Allen, thank you very much for 
interrupting the new baby fatherhood process to join us and talk some wine. Uh, I think I can say without fear of contradiction from anybody that you are certainly the most successful failed winemaking student Stellenbosch has ever produced, and there are lots of happy <laughs> wine drinkers as a result. Uh, keep making it, keep entertaining us with superb wine, and uh, keep that Finless and legacy going strong as you do. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. And thanks to everyone that's joined in. There we go. Peter Allen Finlayson, maker of Kristallin with his brother, maker of Harbordils Clough for his father-in-law. You don't want to get that wrong. And giving us some terrific wine. Love the Pinot Noir, especially that cinema cuvee out of Kristallin. But also, if you have a chance, the Syrah is taking advantage of the different terroir that they have access to out at Harbordils Clough. You've got a really strong selection of wine that are well worth the time and effort in seeking them out. And that wraps us up for another week of the uh, uh, Dan Really Likes Wine Show, brought to you by Pick and Pay. If you're not already a member of the Pick and Pay Wine Club, there you have it on screen. You just send through your smart shopper number. You join the club free of charge. You get discounts. You get loads of smart shopper points. And you get 10 particular wines at a really, really good price. Plus, just explore some terrific South African wine. Big thank you today to Donovan Ral, star of Vikings and maker of terrific, terrific wine, and to Peter Allen Finlayson from Cristalum and Harbiel's Clough. That does it for Monday. So what's coming up later on this week or tomorrow, you'll see myself in conversation with Joe Waring from Wines of South Africa, as well as Greg Sherwood, as we look ahead to the South African Wine Tribe that is in the UK next edition next Wednesday night. It'll be featuring Duncan Savage, also JC from Creation, and uh, Vereen Souls from Tesla Dahl. That's all next week, but look out for the preview. That'll be online tomorrow, not live, pre-recorded, so keep an eye out on your favorite social media platform. And then 5 o'clock on Thursday, Jan Bulland Kutzir, the Springbok great, who now makes such fabulous wine. He'll be joining us from Friersenhof, and we'll also be speaking to Jacques Fillion from Boschendal and taking care of a couple of heavyweight reds. So it's another busy week on Dan Really Likes Wine. Keep enjoying your wine. Keep celebrating South African wine. And keep taking advantage of the fact that if you're watching from here in South Africa, we live in the best winemaking country in the world. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you live on Thursday and online again tomorrow. Goodbye.